All right, so I guess we'll begin our lecture on the esoteric pentagram. So now that you're in phase C, you'll notice that some of the lectures are a lot more information and it's a lot more uh, uh, practices. Um, like we will be getting into like invocations and conjurations, which are like what Lee taught you. Lee taught you Balin, I believe. Yes. Yeah. So there's one. There's practices like that that are more advanced and more powerful for protection. And this symbol we use in Gnosticism a lot. You'll see it even a lot around this room. It's there by the tree of life here. And it's hung around windows and stuff. Yeah, I bought a little one. Oh, did you buy some? Yeah. I noticed, I, I was going to put the thing, the box out, and I noticed they're, they're all gone. Right? They're all sold out. <laughs> I got one on my door, my door. Yep. I, I, I need to get a couple more. <laughs> Yes, yeah. it's generally used as a sign of protection, and it's also a really sacred sign, and it has a lot of esoteric teachings in this ma this um, amount of symbols. And we're gonna dive a little deeper into why these symbols are placed where they are, what they mean, why is it considered protective, and uh, we'll take it from there. The pentagram represents the human being in its entirety. The Gnostic pentagram is the human figure with four limbs and one unique apex, which is the head. The entire treasury of the light is contained within the pentagram, and this allegorizes the human being. So why we put this up first is we want you to understand that the pentagram picture is a representation of, of a person. Of a person. Because a pentagram is a really old sign. And everyone kind of has some idea in their mind associated with pentagram. A lot of the ideas associated with it are negative because that's just the way maybe one culture takes over and makes the, the symbols of another culture bad, that kind of idea. But we're going to look into what the symbol actually is and why maybe it has an evil connotation and what the other connotations are. But before we even get into that, it's most important to realize that what we're trying to say is this is a representation of the human figure. And that's why it's placed the way it is. That's why the eyes are at the top and everything else. Okay. The pentagram is represented in the Masonic tradition as the blazing star that is surrounded by the black and white mosaic pavement. This symbolizes the dualistic nature of the five-pointed star as a representation of both positive and negative qualities. So if you were to enter a Masonic lodge in any country of the world, you would see a checkered floor, and in the middle of that checkered floor there would be a five-pointed star. In North America it's always a five-pointed star, in some other countries sometimes it's six or seven, but it's mostly the five-pointed star. It's always surrounded by the black and white mosaic pavement uh, to teach duality, that the symbol is dual in purpose. Man has a duality, and life has a duality. There's always the positive, there's always the negative. So too, the star symbolizes positive qualities and negative qualities. The pentagram expresses the dominion of spirit over the elements of nature. With this magical sign, we can command the elementals of nature, fire, earth, air, and water. That sounds pretty mystical. It sounds like we're using the sign to actually some make some outside force happen. But what we're referring to when we're talking about uh, the elementals of nature is we have to realize that the elementals of nature, they exist outside of us. It, all these elements exist outside of us. They also exist internally as well. They all affect us different ways. They affect our personality, our mood. Uh, we carry elements of each of these four elements inside of ourselves. Internally, the pentagram is the sign of the perfect human, the human in control of the elements of their interior nature. It is the dominion of will over fire, emotions and passions, earth, actions and conduct, air, thoughts and desires, and water, the control and proper use of the energy. You might recognize some of these from uh, Lee's lecture on the three traitors. Uh, so the symbol 
the pentagram has this connotation as well. So that's trying to raise above our lower natures. Again, it's fighting against the, the, the three traitors that, uh, that always conspire to keep us down. Namely, emotion, which is always symbolized by fire, the passions, the desires. Earth, which is physical and concrete, like actions, the actions that we physically do. Air related to the mind for the thoughts and the desires. And water for the control and proper use of energies. As man is a fivefold being, the five points of the pentagram are a reminder of the necessity to balance the five centers of the human organism. The five points of the pentagram also represent the five elements fire, air, earth, water, and the fifth element is sometimes called ether or described as spirit. Uh, it's, it's, it's been talked about for a long time in many of ancient occult texts and even more recent medieval occult texts. But as we see the five points of the pentagram, they do also relate to the five centers that you are familiar with. So a pentagram with the point facing up would be someone who is in control of those five centers, has them under control. The pentagram with the head or the superior point facing down would be someone who is controlled by those five centers, who's unbalanced. Now we will look into the duality of the pentagram. Have man ascending, man descending. According to the direction of its points, this magical symbol is order or confusion, the Virgin Mary or Lilith, victory or death. It is the sign of the divine lamb or the accursed goat of Mendes. Now, when we see this upside down star, we always we're pretty familiar with this picture of the goat in the center and. Somehow we get a connection with Satan worshippers and something to do with goats. The re <laughs> it's generally <laughs> this is <laughs> yeah, <you're right. laughs> yeah. And, and, and the Masonic community is always uh, being level charges against it. Something to do with goats. <laughs> but the, the image of the goat is representative of like the animalistic passions, the desires, the ego. And this is why when it's upside down, you see the, the goat. When it's right side up, you see the figure of the man. But it could just as well be the figure of the man with his head facing downwards, descending, falling into the abyss, as it were. When the superior po point is placed down, it is a representation of Satan, not as a person, but as a misdirected force, as a misdirected internal force. The inverted star does, however, attract negative entities in higher planes. A human figure, head downwards, represents a demon in the form of intellectual subversion, disorder, or madness. So, what we're trying to get across here is that it's not a representation of Satan as some kind of external demon figure that exists outside of yourself who's coming to try and scare you or attack you or whatever. It, it's a representation of an internal principle. We can see this with the, this is a Rider Waite tarot deck. It's pretty familiar to Western culture. Card 15 is the devil. See the inverted pentagram on the forehead. The flame descending, the man and woman, both with the Kunda buffer tail, of Satan, and they're chained to the devil. This is an Egyptian uh, style tarot card. The same card, card 15, uh, it shows the Egypt Egyptian version of the devil, which was named Typhoon Baphomet. But the interesting thing about this is, I know it's hard to see because it's down at the bottom. So the number is 15? In the tarot deck, the number is 15. Oh. It's the 15th card in the tarot deck, yep. Yeah. But in the Egyptian tarot deck, instead of being called the devil, or this one's also a Spanish tarot deck, instead of being called Diablo, it's called Passion. That gives us greater insight as to what this card can mean too. Not that these people are chained to Satan, or chained to the devil. They're, they're chained and controlled to their passions and their desires. Controlled by their emotions. Um, so this is where the misconception of it being satanic gets. It does 
uh, represent negative elements, but they aren't external from us. They are the elements inside of us. So even when you see Satanists worshipping these kind of images, it's not, I, I don't know if they know if they're worshipping an outside entity they're trying to, or if they're just not familiar exactly with all the symbolism behind it. So, although it's a pretty serious symbol, and we all have maybe negative feelings when we see this, we should realize that it is a negative thing, but it's trying to tell us to look inside at what it is is negative. We, we do have a, a tendency to look outwards and try to blame uh, our problems or anything on some outward force or find some external threat, but it's more important to find the internal one. The superior point aiming towards the heaven represents the internal Christ. It symbolizes the divine. It is utilized in white magic in order to call divine beings. This would be in the higher dimensions. Or here, but in the higher dimensions you could physically see them. Here's a picture of... Uh, pentagram with the chalice and the sword causing the negative entities to flee. Negative entities tremble and run in the presence of this symbol. Within this symbol is contained the information necessary for the creation of a philosophical stone and the accomplishment of the great work. So with this superior point facing upwards, it, it's a tremendously powerful sign. It, and it's a holy sign and a divine sign. Um, and why that is, we're going to get into. This is, a, this is one of the older drawings of, the, of this picture, one of, one of the more original pitch, uh, drawings. From, this one was from about the 1800s, the late 1700s. So the first section we're going to look at is the chalice. What I planned to do was uh, hand out <laughs> these little cards so you could watch and follow, but uh, they're all sold out. Yeah, all scared. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, do you want the lights off, or is this good? Or you can put the lights off if you like. Yeah, yeah, it might be easier to see. Yeah. So the first symbol we're going to look at is the symbolism, the symbol of the chalice. It's found on uh, the left side of the pentagram. If you're looking at the pentagram, it's the right side, but as the pentagram symbolizes the person with the eyes facing out, it's the left side of, of the human figure of the pentagram. In the upper, in the upper uh, left side. The chalice is the feminine receptive and negative force. It is also a representation of the female sex organ, which in his book a lot is called the yoni, that's why I wrote it. I don't know whether they like to use Sanskrit terms. However, since the chalice is placed in the superior part of the pentagram, the head, its deeper representation is that of the illuminated mind. Because even though the symbol even though this whole picture has so many symbols on it, they aren't arbitrarily placed. They're placed where they're placed for specific reasons. It, this is a symbol of the mind that has been saturated by the Christic force of the risen Kundalini energy. And the chalice has been an esoteric symbol for a long time, uh, related throughout time, the Arthurian legends, the uh, legend of the Holy Grail, mm -hmm. such like this. But the fact that it's placed right near the head of the pentagram tells us that it's, this is the symbol of the illuminated mind, the receptive mind. And we notice a lot that like, in Buddhist pictures, the Buddhists are always holding a, a bowl that's empty. You can see it on that uh, statue later if you want. But a lot, they're, they're always holding a bowl that's empty, and that means that's like an illuminated mind, a mind 
that has been freed and cleared and is ready for uh, the being to enter. Now we're going to look at the symbolism of the bamboo rod. The scepter of bamboo is symbolic of the human spinal column. This accounts for its placement between the legs and the arms of the human pentagram, as so the spine is placed in there. The seven knots or spaces along the rod are the symbolic representation of the seven chakras that the kundalini energy must ascend. I'm sure that you're familiar with this from the lectures that Lee gave about the chakras and the seven main chakras. That's why there's seven spaces, seven knots on the bamboo rod, which represents the spinal column. The three tassels at the top uh, of the scepter are an indication of the three primary forces, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Keter, Hokma, Bina, which was from your lecture last week, <laughs> uh, Holy Affirming, Holy Denying, Holy Reconciling, etc., etc. This uh, three primary forces is found in many, many cultures. Even scientifically, it's the positive force, the negative force, and the neutral force. And out of these three forces, creation comes. So it's not some kind of vague concept that we can't wrap our heads around. Even science tells us positive, negative, neutral. There's three primary forces. Symbolism of the sword. The sword is the masculine, creative, and positive force. And also when you see this, when we say the positive force and the feminine negative force, it's not like morally positive. It's like electronically, like positive charge, negative charge. That's what we're talking about. We always got to say that because we don't want the ladies to think we're trying to give them a bad rap. <laughs> yeah, or else how could a sword be positive? <laughs> right. <laughs> It is also a representation of the phallus, a representation of the will of the initiate or the individual, and a symbol of justice. Since it is placed at the bottom, below of the pentagram figure, you see these are the two legs that it's between, its deeper representation is that of the kundalini force that we must raise from the lower to higher, as exemplified by King Arthur who raised the sword from the stone. So it also has that connotation of actually, as actually the kundalini force. The fact that it's below the pentagram mm -hmm. can show that it's been conquered or controlled or that it, it has to raise. But we're, what, what, what we're going to show soon is that those three symbols we just talked about, the sword, the bamboo, and the chalice, they all, they all have uh, conjoint significations. The sword is the sacred fire within each of us. The Kundalini Force. So here we see those three we just talked about the sword, the bamboo rod, the spinal column, <coughs> and the chalice. Yes? What about, um, that kind of reminds me of the Shriners, you know? Yep. Yeah. Well, that, <laughs> they, they don't. Is that their kind of. Yeah, I guess it's a scimitar, so it's like an Arab sword, and the Shriners use all uh, Arabic images. Okay. So, it could be similar in that sense. Mm -hmm. I'm not too sure no. exactly what the Shriners I know. <laughs> denote them as. Not being a Shriner, but... <laughs> but I do know that they use it because yeah. it's Arabic. And okay. that's why they always call their uh, their temples like the Mocha Temple. Oh, yeah, that's right. Their bands, the uh, Oriental Bands. And, okay. By use of the will, the Kundalini energy, which is the sword, must rise up the spinal column the rod, illuminating the seven chakras, until it illuminates and reaches the mind, the chalice. Then it can settle in the heart temple. These symbols have been ever present on the altar of the magician. And so we see that on these tarot cards. Now the, that, that is one interesting fact about the tarot cards is that they contain a wealth of esoteric hidden information besides just their use as a divination tool. So here you have the ma magician with the, the occult maxim as above, so below. And on the table you find the pentacles, 
which is symbolized by the pentagram, the rod, the chalice, and the sword. What is he holding? Hmm? What is that? It's just, yeah, it's like a, a wand or a, okay. a yeah. rod. Symbol, symbol as above, symbol yeah. 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 yeah, as above. Symbol. And then he's got the eternity sign. Yep, the holy head. eight above his head. Yeah. Yep. Which is a symbol of eternity. Yeah. Lo lots of symbolism in the. Uh, so if you want to read the tarot cards, you have to really understand it, right? To feel it, you you yeah. want to know what all these things mean. Yeah, like they have the representation, yeah. like uh -huh. that the people use for divination. They have mm -hmm. that representation, but they also have the deeper representation, the more esoteric, that isn't even openly. Mm -hmm. It might be understood by uh, people who use the tarot mm -hmm. for divination. I'm not sure, but. Even looking through certain cards on the deck, you can see that there are ones that are contain information that we talk about here quite a bit. Like I, uh, the two of in this deck, uh, two of cups. It's a it's a man and a woman holding the cup, and out of the center of the cup, the caduceus of Mercury is rising. So it's an allusion to the mm -hmm. the alchemical process. Now we're going to look at the symbolism of the seal of Solomon, also called the Star of David, but. When it's drawn this way, the, with a circle around it and one triangle white and black, it's usually called the Seal of Solomon. Mm -hmm. The Seal of Solomon is an alchemical representation of the union of two forces. And I believe that Lee did talk to you about this probably in mm -hmm. several lectures, probably because I know that he's uh -huh. interested in it. He knows quite a bit about it. So it's a representation of the union of two forces, positive and negative, fire and water, male and female. It's like a balancing of opposites. Although it does contain many different layers of uh, symbolism. The superior triangle is Keter, Bina, or Hokma, Bina. Uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, whichever names you want to give to it. Osiris, Isis, Horus. It's been around for a long time. Positive, negative, neutral. <laughs> it is a representation of the spiritual. This is a representation of the spirit, of all things spiritual. This triangle, the superior white triangle. The inferior triangle, just called superior and inferior because of the direction of the point, represents the demon of desire, the demon of the mind, the demon of the ill will. Basically the three traitors that you've heard about from previous lectures. is a representation of the material the material world, the physical world. And this is a sign of the great struggle that we all face. This has been explained as the battle between spirit and matter. That spirit is wrapped up or engrossed in matter as the ego engrosses or wraps up the essence. So this battle is the liberation of the essence from the ego, the separation of the spiritual from the material as one representation. But to the, al the alchemist, uh, the ancient al alchemist did use the symbol as well to represent the uniting of two separate and di uh, opposite forces. They, they hid it under fire and water. But it was a representation of the uh, uniting of the male and female forces. We look into some further alchemical symbolism. In the center of the pentagram, there are four icons that are symbolic of the alchemical process. The caduceus of mercury, which emanates from the creative organs of the human pentagram. So that's actually where its location is found on the pentagram, in the creative uh, organs. Symbolizes the two channels that ascend the spinal column, Ida and Pingala, like we were talking about at the beginning. The symbol of the sun represents the masculine, creative, positive solar force, the one channel. The symbol of the moon represents the feminine, receptive, and negative lunar force. These two forces are utilized to awaken a third force, which is known as the Kundalini, and is symbolized by the sign of Mercury that ascends the two channels of the spinal column. So this is from ancient alchemical texts, even from the 16th, 17th century. They would use the symbols of the planets to represent some of their ideas. 
Mercury they use as a sign for the Kundalini. That's why a lot when you research alchemists, they always talk about sulfur, salt, and mercury. It's kind of how they hid this exact representation. They put mercury because in a thermometer, that's what they used to put yep. mercury, you know? It does rise, yeah. straight up, yeah. with, with heat. Wow, that's right. That's yep, enough. that's it. That's a good point. That's it. That's true. And they also had to hide their, what they were studying and what they were learning. They, hid it. they had to hide it under some kind of scientific uh, facade, because we know that the church was very dominant back then. <laughs> And uh, this was the kind of stuff you would go to the stake for. Yeah. <laughs> <The> barbecue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they hid it under all the symbolism. They hid it behind all these poems that are we read and like, what the heck are they trying to tell us here? But there was an inner doctrine. So now we're going to talk about the symbolism of the apex or the head. The sign of Jupiter is placed, this is the four, the sign of Jupiter, in the center of the forehead. This represents wisdom and the power of the perfected individual over all creation. Jupiter is the planetary sign associated with law, rights, and wealth or poverty. In this sense, it would be spiritual wealth. Below the sign of Jupiter, you will see the eyes always opened. They are the eyes of divinity, the eyes of God. They represent the infinite, the alpha, the holy eight, and the equilibrium between the heart, the mind, and the sex. The three brains that you will be familiar with from all the previous lectures. Here we have a representation of the holy eight. The mouth, being this section, represents the word as the whole sign of the pentagram is the symbol of the word made flesh which is kind of a strange statement, but it means it's the symbol, this whole pentagram symbol, is a sign of the individual awakening the consciousness, realizing himself, becoming more like the divine. And that's the symbol of the word made flesh, where we are made in the image of God, where we raise ourselves to that actual image, through conscious effort and work. Now we'll look at some of the planetary symbolism. If you observe the extended arms of the pentagram, you will see the sign of Mars. Is this sign? And on some of the signs you'll notice they're the same, but slightly different. <laughs> this yeah. one has a cross through, this one doesn't. That kind of represents how the planets had two polarities. They have uh, both a positive and a negative effect on humanity, on people. They have the planets also have their higher side and their lower side. Uh, the sign of Mars symbolizes the forces of willpower that transform man. Mars is the planetary sign that is associated with war, power, and will. The sign of Mars is a sign of strength, spiritual strength, and reminds us of the battle that we must wage against the ego. So as Mars is a symbol of war, it's not a symbol of external war, it's the internal war. Much like the, like the, the deeper meanings of many doctrines, like the Muslim Jihad is in a Jihad against external infidels, it's an internal holy war. That's what this, that's that's how we're associating uh, that's how we're associating this symbol of Mars with the internal struggle, the internal war mm -hmm. that will bring us power, but that we must fight by the use of our own will. That we must consciously fight. How do we fight it? All the techniques that have been learned so far, self observation, mm -hmm. everything like this. Well, now we're looking at these planetary signs. Again the same planet, opposite forces. In the two inferior angles, which are the legs, is found the sign of Saturn. This symbolizes the law of death. All perfected uh, beings defeat death and are transformed into resurrected beings. 
Saturn is a planetary sign associated with death, inheritance, its opposite in association is life, and it's also associated with the sword of justice, which may be another reason why the sword is placed between the two symbols mm -hmm. Saturn. Uh, this is a quote from the Nag Hammadi Library. Verily I say unto you, none of those who fear death will be saved, for the kingdom belongs to those who put themselves to death. It was a quote given by Jesus in the Apocryphon of James in the Gnostic Gospels. Death equals the death of the ego, the practice of dying from moment to moment. These kind of terms. So we see, this is a very interesting statement. The kingdom belongs to those who put themselves to death. Obviously, it's not to be taken literally, <laughs> but... Now, which I think some of them did take it literally, right? Well, it seems like throughout every culture and yeah. every tradition, they, they end up taking their scriptures literally, mm -hmm. and they lose a lot of the inner meaning, That's the right. more profound information in there. Exactly. Like, don't, no one lights a candle and puts it under a bowl. There's Christian groups who say, okay, you can't do that. You can't put a candle under a bowl. Is that what the gospel was trying to tell us? Or are they trying to say you can't have knowledge, you can't be illuminated and not share it with others. You have to look at the deeper meanings. <laughs> yeah. Now we'll talk about all those, we talked about these in the alchemical sense, now we're going to talk about these in the planetary sense. The sun, the light, the clear fire, the awakened conscious, associated with health, life, and mystical matters. The moon is a symbol of fertility uh, and the dominion of the water over the waters of life, associated with imagination, the subconscious, and reproduction. Mercury is a symbol of intelligence, the prudent activity of the sage or the, the initiate, the, the individual, associated with reason, science, and healing. Venus, just from here down associated with love, chastity, and beauty. Associated uh, also with uh, imagination, love, and marriage. Now, the combination of the sign of Mercury and Venus can illustrate a deeper representation as the intelligent use of love and chastity to accomplish the healing or regeneration of man. And this is one reason why these two symbols may be merged into one symbol and why they appear above the caduceus of Mercury. Because these two symbols and the caduceus of Mercury are outlining the alchemical process. Uh, like we said before, Mercury is the symbol of the Kundalini. Venus, the force of love, is the force that we need to utilize in order to awaken the force of Kundalini. Now we'll look at the Hebrew words. There's four of them uh, along the pentagram. Below the sign of the sun, we find the Hebrew word kafar. Kafar has a direct English translation as expiation, which means to atone or make amends in a spiritual sense. It has been used in the Old Testament in a few cases to represent also mercy. The understanding of this is before asking for mercy, we must first repent for the crime that we have committed. We must comprehend the ego, the ego through meditation and self-observation and then take the direct action to eliminate it. You cannot ask for forgiveness and expect to receive mercy if afterwards you then continue committing the same error. This is a... Uh, we can kind of understand this. I mean, when you're chosen, they tell you, if you go to a religious school, you have to have confession and say what you're sorry for. And I'm sorry that I, I hit my brother. Okay, say a, a billion Hail Marys and then you'll be okay. And you come back the next week, I'm sorry I uh, hit my brother. If you were really sorry, you would comprehend, is it right to hit your brother? What motivates you to hit your brother? What is the negative outcome of hitting your brother? And you would take the steps 
to eliminate that action from yourself before you, you, you melt down to pray or ask for divine intervention or mercy. This is the meaning of kafar that we understand it as expiation. I think that makes a little sense. <laughs> The next word we're going to look at is Pashad, and it's located below the moon. Pashad directly translates to English as fear. This is the fear of the laws, the fear of karma. It does not mean that you have to be afraid of God or the divinity or anything. It means that you have to comprehend the laws and apply them, because if you do not, you do not self-realize. It is the fear of being devoured by the lion, the law, instead of devouring it. So this is the fear of understanding the laws and then not working in harmony with them. So it's not so much like a scared fear, it's more of a respect for the higher principles, for karma, for the things that we've been told numerous times when we come here. Above the sign of the moon is the Hebrew word Adam. This is the Adam Kadmon of the ancient Kabbalists, the primordial man, the perfect man, the divine androgynous, which might scare you guys from last week's lecture, <laughs> but this was touched on, I believe, by my brother. This is a symbolic representation of it from the medieval period. It is the embodiment of all ten sephirah of the tree of life. Oops. It is the being before the division of the sexes. So, what we're trying to say is a person who has created all their solar bodies, they have all their divinities, they've incarnated the being, the symbol, this word, Adam, the, uh, in its primary sense, isn't the, the male Adam of Adam and Eve. This is the name of uh, the unified being before the division of the sexes even occurred. Uh, people in ancient times were actually called, instead of being called human or something like that, they were called Adam before the division. So we do associate it with Adam and Eve, but even that story of creation, which I'm not, it's not necessary that people be familiar with it, but in that story, God takes Eve from inside of Adam, from his rib, and makes, makes woman from inside of man. But before the woman was taken out, those two forces, feminine and negative, they were in one being, and then the being was separated into sexes. Now we have above the sign of the sun is the sacred and unpronounceable name of God in Hebrew, yod heh vau heh which is also what the word tetragrammaton represents. Four-letter word is the Greek way of saying yod heh vau heh It represents this four-letter word, which represents the highest name of divinity. That's why it's unpronounceable, not because they can't pronounce it, because they don't out of respect. It's only pronounced in the Jewish culture once a year on uh, their most holy day, which is Yom Kippur, I believe. And it's pronounced in their main temple at 12 o'clock noon, so the sun doesn't cast a shadow. <laughs> and it's only pronounced by the high priest under trumpet blasts. <laughs> under what? Trumpet blasts. This name, <clears throat> yod heh vau -Hey. but yod heh vau -Hey is like saying I-H-V-H. -H. Oh, okay. So, to say yod heh vau -Hey isn't like pronouncing this word. Oh, okay. Just like how tetragrammaton, it, it has the connotation of, of this word, but its literal translation is four-letter word. But because of the ideas it represents, these words become holy, even the word tetragrammaton. Um, so, that's an interesting fact. The Jews, when they read this in their Old Testament, when they came across this word for God, they substituted it with another word, Adonai. So they always read the word Adonai, which means Lord, instead of reading Tetragrammaton out loud, or their pronunciation for it. And ancient Hebrew was written without, uh, without vowels. So 
that's why it's like it's hard to decipher some of the Hebrew text where they have more than one translation. There's no vowels written in it, and it's written continuously, so there's no breaks, there's no periods, there's no commas. So what they did is when they uh, when they were when they were reading this word, they always substituted Adonai, and then so they so that they would remember that they put in the vowel marks. Like this is ancient Hebrew that has no vowel. Now newer Hebrew they have vowels. They use marks. They look like little dots or something to tell you what vowels should be in there so that you can pronounce it correctly. They would put the vowel marks for Adonai inserted into this word, so just so they would remember to say Adonai instead of pronounce that word. But if you anglicize it and read this word with the vowel marks for Adonai, that's where you come up with the word Yehovah, which is one that in Western culture we use as the highest name to denote God. That's a little off topic, but that's some of the uh, Jewish history that my brother has been pouring at me, <laughs> coming to the surface. Uh, the word tetragrammaton is originally a Greek word that literally means four-letter word and directly refers to the unpronounceable name for God in Hebrew, yod heh vau -Hey. Is that the word then that the, um, the highest priest uh, would say on Yom Kippur, yod heh vau -Hey? He says it, but he says it as their historic actual pronunciation is. But he, only he knows it out of the oh, all the Jewish okay. priests. Oh. So how they pronounce it, I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Like what, what, how they actually phonetically say it. There's actually a lot of people in the Jewish community who don't even believe their high priest had the pronunciation of this word anymore. They believe it was lost, but because it's the high priest says it, and then he passes it from mouth to ear to the next high priest who says yeah. it, okay. they can't really prove that they don't have it, because well, you're never supposed to hear it. <laughs> it's too sacred, I guess. In other languages, the name that denotes God also consists of four letters. So in Spanish, Dios, in Latin, Dios. <laughs> in Greek, Theos, but TH is one letter in Greek. France, Deo. Turkish, Asar. What's that? In French, you say Dieu. Yes, but it's got four letters, right? D E U S. French. Yep, yep. Oh, yeah. Yep, so we're trying to. For some reason, holy names have always been associated with four letter words. In many cultures. Some cultures are not, but in a lot of them they are. The Tetragrammaton, which is written like this, which is yod hey vau hey, is a sacred summation of the number four. The Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or whichever you like to call it best, first logos, second logos, third logos, Keter, Chokmabina, uh, plus the unity of life is the Holy Four. So these three creative forces that we've talked about, Emanating from the main source is how you get the holy four, is a representation of the holy four. In the words uh, yod hey vau hey, we find our being, our most complete divinity. From the Ain Sof, which is a super divine atom of each one of us, the three primary forces emanate and give their final synthesis. Three plus the one which they come from, it's four. The Father, one, the Son, two, the Holy Spirit, three. These three emanate from the Absolute, which is four. So this concept is, is a little bit more abstract than the other concepts we were dealing with, but it, it, like we said, it's the three creative primary forces emanating from the infinite, the absolute, which surround all of them. This holy four is what brings forth all the other creation, all the other divinities, all the other elements, the physical world, as we saw in the Tree of Life. Uh, the masculine and feminine principle, principles are also contained in the holy yod heh vau -Hey. The Yod represents the eternal masculine creative principle. The first He, the eternal feminine receptive principle. The Va, 
the phallic masculine principle, fire. And the last hay, the uterus feminine principle, water. In these four letters, the two feminine and masculine principles of the microcosm, which is a fancy word for saying uh, universe or the picture on a big scale, and the microcosm, which is another fancy word of saying the individual, are represented. So as we see, we have these uh, four representations. They seem to be the same. We have the masculine and the masculine and the feminine and the feminine. But this is the masculine creative principle uh, represented in the universe. The universal creative principle. This is the universal feminine principle. This is the individual, like inside of us, inside of man, masculine principle, and the individual feminine principle, water. Which is another relation of the maxim as above, so below, or man is a small universe, <clears throat> man is the microcosm, and the world is the macrocosm. Now we're going to look at some of the numerical symbolism. So as you see at the top, there was one, two, and one, two, three. They're not totally necessary and don't appear on all of these uh, representations of the esoteric pentagram, but on either side of the head, we observe the numbers one, two, and one, two, three. Also the letters that correspond, two letters, three letters. The one, two, above the word te, represents the duality of the pentagram, the positive and negative, the masculine and feminine, the two polarities. This whole pentagram can actually be divided up into a duality, right down the center. The side of the moon is on is the more feminine sides, like the chalice. The, on the side the sun is, is where the sword originates from. And also those, you saw those two uh, different representations of the planets. The masculine picture is on, is on the side of the sun, the feminine on the side of the moon. That's another dualistic representation. The one, two, three, above the word tra, represents the fact that these two polarities emerge from the trinity. So from the creative process, the creative, three creative forces, we end up with the two opposite forces of masculine and feminine. The Kabbalistic sum of these numbers, 1 plus 2 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3, is 9, which indicates the ninth sphere, the work in alchemy, which I'm sure you've heard in past lectures when they always talk about the ninth sephiroth being this one. You saw it, the foundation stone, being the work in alchemy. Now we're going to talk about it as a talisman. The best electrum, which is like a talisman or a symbol, a metallic symbol, is the esoteric pentagram, for it causes the demons to shake and flee. It can be used at windows, above beds, at door entrances, as medallions, etc., and it has been used for all of these purposes for many, many years. It's not the sole possession of a Gnostic organization. It doesn't originally spring from the Gnostic organization. It's one of these symbols that has been very important throughout history. And therefore, it's very important to the Gnostic organization. The best electrums are composed of seven metals, for it represents the seven planets, the seven regions, and the seven bodies. As we know in these kind of studies, seven is a, is a big number. It has a lot of meaning, uh, mostly representing the seven dimensions, the seven bodies that we must create. This is a representation of them. This is the moon. Uh, the region of the moon is Gabriel, or the angel of the moon. Uh, the metal associated with the moon is silver. Uh, Mercury. The uh, region associated, associated with uh, Mercury is the Archangel Raphael, and the metal is Mercury. Venus, uh, associated with Uriel and Copper. Sun, is associated with Mikael, the highest of all the Archangels, and <coughs> the metal of gold. Mars is associated with the Archangel Samael, and the metal iron. 
Jupiter is uh, associated with the Archangel Zachariel and Tin. And Saturn and Orif is uh, represented by Orifel and Lead. This isn't uh, necessary to memorize or anything. This, this is just this. This is a system that has been around for a long time. That's these are the seven uh, ancient planets. These are some of the, uh, the representations that the ancient people gave to the seven planets. And these are some of the ruling forces. There are also the seven planets which uh, have the most impact on our daily life. Now we're going to talk about the power of the symbol as a whole. A sign is nothing by itself and has no force apart from the doctrine that it represents. However, a sign which sums all the occult forces of nature naturally fills the elementary spirits and others with respect and fear and enforces their obedience because it represents a power greater than their own. So we have to kind of remember that the, like the picture, it has power and meaning, but only because of the doctrine that it contains, the wisdom that it conceals, what it stands for. And we can see this in society, uh, easier examples would be like, everyone looks at a peace sign and knows immediately what it stands for. So everyone can look at this one symbol, the peace sign, they have the same emotions kind of in them. Another good example of that would be the, the Christian cross. It's a sign that's worshipped throughout the whole world, and the Christians, it, this symbol, these two lines, denote their whole belief system. It's a representation of their whole practice even though the cross itself is very ancient. So like, just like that, this symbol gathers all its power from what it represents, from what it teaches, not merely just from the pictures being all in a strange order. So as a summary, like I said, this is a little bit of a shorter lecture. It is necessary to work with the staff of Mercury of the pentagram. It is necessary to transmute the sexual energy in order to awaken the sacred fire and make it ascend the spinal column. In this manner, it is possible to develop all our faculties and powers. When we know how to transmute the sexual fluids, we uh, do not make the mistake of spilling the glass of Hermes, the chalice. Then the retained fluids are transformed into energy. This energy bipolarizes itself in solar and lunar atoms of a very high voltage that ascend through the two channels that coil themselves along the spinal column, the Eden and Pingala. The two channels that appear in the staff of Mercury, represented by those two serpents. These solar and lunar atoms make contact in the Trevini, which is near the Cossacks, the tailbone, and then by means of induction awaken a third force. It is necessary to work with the sun and the moon, the masculine and feminine principles, the male and female. Only in this manner is it possible to awaken that sacred fire, which will transform us radically. That's a quick synthesis of the alchemical process. Um, kind of just brushed over it, but you get the idea. It's more to be studied in depth on your own, possibly. Um, but the star is representation of the whole alchemical process, and that's where it gains its power. That's why it is a force used to drive away negative entities or things of a lower nature, things of uh, lust or desires or what we would generally consider to be the eagles. There's a microcosmic star of practice that we're going to learn briefly. There exists a powerful mantra that when vocalized instantaneously forms the flaming star or pentagram within the astral plane, the sight of which causes the tenor of us to scatter in terror. So this mantra forms the star. Um, the star, we, we do it here in the physical, has an effect like a protective effect, kind of like Baleline. But in the astral, if you were to perform it, you could actually see a pentagram, pentagram of light. <clears throat> this powerful mantra is in its <laughs> Sanskrit <laughs> Kleem Krishnaya Govindaya Gobihana Vayabhaya Swaha 
and there are movements that accompany it. That we look at it now. This mantra has three distinct stages. Upon the recital of Kleem, which the Hindu occultists called the seed of attraction, we, pro we provoke a flow of Christic energy from the superior dimensions, and a kind of downward door is opened. Then, throughout the body of the, the mantra, Krishnaya, Govindaya, Kopihana, the force fuses with the person reciting the words. Finally, upon reciting Swaha, the force is sent out to do its work, and the one who has received the Christic energy can radiate it with tremendous force. This is how the practice is done. I can exemplify it for you. It's like when we would say to cleanse the room, we bring this forth on, we actually make the microcosmic star in succession. Much like Baileen, but a uh, more strength involved. Um, and, we, and we repeat uh, the words mentally as we do it. But we start like as we do, like right over left, step out with the right, and open up, clean. Krishnaya being the apex, Govindaya, Gobihana, Vayabhaya, Swaha. That's just a quick example. Uh, we're going to have a handout of this to, to give you. I don't have it tonight, but next week we'll give you the handout. So you have the words. You don't have to try and remember everything off of just this slide. And that's, that's the microcosmic uh, star practice we make use of. Usually after we uh, would say uh, some kind of protective phrase like Baileen or some of the more powerful ones that we're going to learn in future lectures, you would close by doing this, by trying to retain some of those more protective forces. And that's the end of our lecture. Oh, would you like me to put that back up? Yeah. Um, yeah we what was the, uh, the ohm yeah, symbol that's in the center? Is there a reason that... That wasn't uh, discussed? Well, it's like, there's an A here, so Alpha, Omega. Oh, it has the same oh, connotation okay, yeah, as the whole that, A, that, which no, we, that uh, makes sense. That's infinity. really cool. But I realized that afterwards when I look at this. Thing. No, I didn't really discuss the Alpha and Omega, and I used the word man way too much. <laughs>